own is this location? No, it's, this is low key. It's low key. Yeah, it's low key. Right. You know that door not locked, right? Oh, it's cool. Yeah, All right. I, I got something. <laughs> we, we, trust me, we safe All as right, fuck. All right, All right, yo. <laughs> <laughs> what's up, family? What's going on, guys? What's this location? Oh, what's up? What's up? What's up? This is low key. Yo, yo, hold on. Let me. All right, we're here, guys. What's going on, man? We're here. We're live right now. Let me, let me get it popping right now. Let me. There we go. We got our microphones on. What's up, guys? We're live right now. Welcome to Tariq Radio. Let me um get my audio and stuff together. I, you know, I'm, I'm barely in here. Y'all hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Do that for me. Hit that um, retweet. We in here doing a special Friday broadcast. Somebody said, on oh, my mama mama. Y'all oh, already know my who it mama, is. So mama. Already saying the, East the um, deal to the real, man. man. I got the homie in here, It's man. an honor and a pleasure, man. Man, Y'all see what it do. Side, homie. Y'all know I fuck with the yes, East sir. Side. Real heavy. Real heavy. Um, a legend out here in L.A., real respected brother, ladies and gentlemen, man, real thorough dude, real top-notch brother, man. Um, give it up, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Spider Loaf, man, my pleasure, brother. Man. Pleasure, man, brother. pleasure. What's going on with you, OG? Oh, man, blessings abundant. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I have coined the phrase, which is JITA. JITA is an acronym for gratitude is the attitude. So regardless of what we actually facing at any given moment we try to remain grateful man gratitude is the attitude i am honored and feel blessed to be here bro no doubt i appreciate no the doubt. invite you already know uh we can get into it now now spider now you grew up on the east side what what block did you grow up on? well my father lived on 99th street between mckinley right off of mckinley right off of century and mckinley 99th street however yeah. i lived with my mother mm. And she lived in Compton. So um, I have photographs with me and my older brothers from when I still was in diapers. So I don't um, know exactly how old I was when I was allowed to start going to my father's house, but I had diapers on. Yeah. So I was back and forth between what a lot of people consider Watts and Compton because right. Century but Century, Century, and Central is really traditionally Watts, but they call it East Side, South Central. Where's your family from? Where's your mom and dad from? far as other states type shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My father originates from far as back as I can remember to Arkansas. Yeah. My mother was born here. However, her mother, I believe, Texas. All right, right. Yes. A lot of us come from Texas. Of course, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Now, how many brothers and sisters you got? Uh, my father has um, four boys, including me. Okay. So I have three brothers by my other mother, which is my stepmother, my father's wife. I have two older brothers and a younger brother, and then – there's me, so there's four of us. And then there's also an adopted cousin, uh, shout out to Dice, Michael Black Jr., who um, was my stepmother's sister's son, who was raised in our house, who we we, we call each other brother. So, no doubt. Yeah. Now, you growing up in the 80s over there on the east side, what was it like growing up out there in the 80s? It was real, real out there in the 80s. What was it like for you as a kid? That's when people used to, we used to jump on the back of the ice cream truck and, and catch a ride. Mm. Back in the 80s, we used to play chicken with our bikes, go up to the like 93rd Street School and, um, when it was empty. And the idea was to drive real fast on your bike and crash into somebody or try to kick them over. Um, we used to get on our bikes and ride the Doc Waller. Uh, it was it was a time of being very mischievous uh, in the streets. I had two older brothers that were pretty mischievous. Were actually three, like I explained, and then a lot of uh, neighbors that was mischievous. And we used to do a lot of bad stuff, man. I remember at one point as a child, the bad thing was around Christmas time. We was going from people's houses and stealing the screw, unscrewing certain little Christmas bugs. Mm. And we used to just do that, and we ride our bikes like to throw the bug by your tire because it go poof. Mm -hmm. And I can recall one time, shout out Ira, uh, who lived right across the street from 99th Street School. I, I can recall me and my brothers was like at his house taking his, um, lights, his uh, fucking uh, Christmas lights off. And all my brothers was older than me, and somebody opened the front door, and everybody jumped on their bike and pedaled off. And I panicked, and I ran off and left my bike. Mm. And my brothers had to come back and take me to go get my bike. And I remember um, Ira went and told my parents with my father and my other mother. And that's the one and only time I ever received a, a whooping from my father. He whooped us with like a broomstick. My brothers yeah. got them all the time. But you used to have to hold the counter, bend over, and my brother, my father would get you with that broomstick. And I can recall in the midst of that whooping, uh, him and my stepmother busting up laughing. And, and they were saying, you could tell when it's a new one because before he hit me, I kept like, – 
I was mm. I was reacting before he touched yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, no. there was a lot of things in the East Side. You're not trying to pay the real dark story, but we just had fun being bad. Now, how old were you when you got put on? I've never been put on. Really? Yeah, never. Wow. wow. Um, it's just the opportunity never presented itself. When I came on the set, my scenario was I was like 11th grade, um, 16 years old, going to private school. And I used to start ditching school and just popping up in the set. Yeah. Off the bus mm. with a pistol. Certain things used to take place. I used to react yeah. with my pistol. And I just, before court getting quartered on ever came up, I was from the set. Mm. I was active with my pistol. Mm -hmm. Now, you went to private school. Yeah, 70 Adventist School to be exact. And you went to school with Brandy. Right. I went to school with Brandy, Norwood. The singer Brandy. Yeah, the Brandy. sensation, legendary Brandy. Not only did I go to school with her, um, I was a bit older than her, and we had a very innocent, romantic relationship. Mm. She she chose me to be her boyfriend, although I had a girlfriend that was my age, an actual relationship. Now, saying older, you weren't like, a, you know, no. over the age, and she was under the age. You no, not at all. Let's, let's no, clear. No, no, I no, just no. want to make that clear. Just the school only went up to 10th grade, so it right. was under 10th grade, and then she was a few grades younger. Right. However, I had a girlfriend that everyone was aware of that was my age, and Brandy just made it her business to let everybody know that she was my little girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And it was a very just, you know, very plutonic, nothing physical, not that it was just, it was really a joke. Right, right, right. But if you just look at the confidence she attacked the world with, I want to let the world know she had that confidence way back then mm. because it was her that created this little fake um, energy between she and I. It was nothing real. It was just it was just a joke, a fun little cute thing, but mm. it was something she initiated. And um, I can recall her singing in chapel and me just personally with my personal intuition knowing that her voice was great beyond her age, anything I had ever heard. So I was surprised, shocked, but actually not to find out that she went on to do great things with her voice. It was like a confirmation of what I had, um, saw in her. No doubt. Now let's fast forward, Lope. Yes. Now, when did you first get signed as a rapper to a record label? My first actually, uh, first time actually getting signed was to G-Unit. Mm. Um, however, on an independent level in affiliation and being able to like go in the store and see my name on an on a actual project, that began... Um, in the very early 2000s, when Cam, what's up to Cam? Shout out to Cam. Shout my, out to Cam. My, hey, I got a lot of respect and love for Cam. He's not too happy with me based on some comments I made about the minister following um, Neighborhood Nip Funeral. And, um, you know, he really deep into his beliefs and his connection with that. You know, he was a now, now, what was the comments about the Well, the you know, um, the minister made some comments during the funeral that where he tried to make a, a correlation between 666 and the rolling 60s. Oh. And he did mathematics and he made it seem, I felt like when I was in the Staples Center, it went over everybody's head outside of mine because I have studied the market of the beast extensively. Yeah. And it seemed like he made an untrue correlation. And, you know, I was in a, this personal friend of mine, shout out to the Keyway Christ neighborhood, Nip. And I've been raised um, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a theology sense to be anti Islam. I was raised Protestant. So mm -hmm. even though I'm not a practicing religious person, just when it comes to concepts of doctrine, I'm, I'm naturally someone on the defense. Yeah. Um, traditionally, when I hear, now I'm in a totally different place, but even at that point, I got in a sense of defense when I felt that he misrepresented what 666 was and tried to tie it into six times 10, 60s. He made a, and when I, um, I'm getting loaded at the funeral, and after the funeral, I went live. And um, instead of me just disagreeing with him, I was kind of disrespectful. I think the phrase that really turned um, Cam off and turned him wrong and some of the other brothers was, I was like, fuck cousin, that bullshit. Mm -hmm. And that was a phrase that didn't sit well. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've since taken down the actual content. Good, and, good. And I, 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 um, I submitted or I gave an apology to those that mattered. I don't know how well it was received, but Cam, who's been one of my best friends in the industry, a mentor from day one, has really shifted our energy since then. Even though he accepted my apology verbally, I could tell right, it's been right. way different. I love you though, Cam. I understand how this shit go, my nigga. So what was your connection? I thought you were down with Death Row before G-Unit. Okay, I was. I was, um, like I say, Cam put me on this Camnesia project. Shortly thereafter, 
I was able to collab with Sebo up out of Sacramento. Yeah, shout out um, to Sebo. Shout out to Sebo, the ball head nut, Killer Tay as well, Brother Lynch. And I would also say all of that energy, um, Drace to the Gangster was involved, Yuck My Old Jail Felony. And I got all those opportunities by first being affiliated with my homeboy, Wino, from 190, who was responsible for doing a lot of the successful Coolio production. Yeah. So based on his success um, and me being affiliated with him, it was a lot of doors open mm -hmm. to me. Shout out to Wino for that. And after that little um, phase in my life um, had slowed down, um, I met Suge Knight through my big homie, Ant Rest in Peace and Magic, from A7 Gangster, who had a label, Done Deal Records, yeah. who had the movement of uh, uh, Say the Babies throughout the years. And they attended a meeting with Suge Knight where my name was brought up and I was invited to attend. And then I came, I did a little acapella rap, and then that um, initiated a two-year experience where I was basically Suge Knight artist, although there was never any paperwork, you weren't, you weren't never signed, signed. Right, correct. Right, right, right. Yes. Now, what was that vibe like? You, you know, you blue rag up there, death row, and you know what death row was about. So, what was the, was there tension up there for you? There was no tension. You got to realize traditionally that's a place that started off with Suge and Snoop. Right. So the blending of the blue and the red was not a big issue to introduce over there. And then when you come to the table with as as one such as myself, authentically representing where I'm from. Um, really being a, a, a person that sticks out in the forefront, front line of the culture, respect it usually dictates interaction at the top. Right, You right. know, especially like when you come from a background of being in prison young, you realize there's really no game banging in prison. There may be game banging in the county jail, but when we get to the prison level, we program. And the same dude who got your hood whacked out on your arm, whether he's your best friend or not, he's not your enemy. And that's something you learn. So I've learned that um, from young, going to prison quite young. Now, how old were you when you went to prison? I was 18 the first time I went wow. to prison, yes. How long did you go in? I went um, for two years the first time. I okay. stayed out about six months, and then I returned um, with a sentence of 32 months or 80%. And I paroled in 1999, and I've yet to return back to prison. Now, what was the first two The first before? time was a strong one robbery, petty punk shit. Yeah. I caught up, got two years, took a plea deal. And the second time it was um, ex con with a firearm. Mm. And um, they gave me the 16 doubled up with the 80%. That's when that shit was a real new concept, giving you that low term, doubling it up and give you 80%. Yeah, it was like mid 90s. Now, uh, did you ever get back cool with Snoop? Because. Dog. Yeah, Snoop Dog, yeah. Well, um, back cool. Well, let's, let's, from, let's, let's go yeah, back. Okay, let's go, go, ahead, back go ahead. Because some stuff at Death Row. Okay, sure. Some stuff going on at Death Row. Sure. And, Suge wanted you to kind of throw shots at Yep, Snoop. I stepped up and played the little um, the little torpedo role in the sense of that I was on the label and I allowed Suge to suggest me to uh, be disrespectful to a degree that I didn't personally really agree with. However, I did it. Once I got signed to G-Unit, I made it my business to approach Snoop Dogg and make it um, try to clear the air yeah. because his mother was utilized for subject matter in a very disrespectful uh, right. sense, and I wasn't proud of myself. Right. And I also knew that he had uh, affiliation with my new team that mattered, so I made it my, uh, my business as a man to approach him and clear the air, and he and I, for um, all I could understood, we squashed it. We was cool. And then, however, from what I can um, gather, based upon um, my public clash of character and words with game the, the rapper the game yeah um snoop dog chose to roll with game yeah right, and, right. And, and not be satisfied or happy with me or be i wasn't his east side cripping partner no more and whatever we were about to establish what we had established seemingly was thrown out the window now you were down with suge now how did you get connected with g unit after being down with suge because it's ironic because um, it's right before I met the G Unit camp, I took it upon myself. Shout out to John, Reggie Wright too, the whole Bond First uh, team because John, who is Reggie Wright's partner in that uh, venture, he used to uh, run the Death Row website way back in the day. Yeah. And um, I can recall asking him at a time when I was dissatisfied with what was going on to take me off the website. And he told me, I can't do that unless somebody from the actual label tells me to spider, I wouldn't mind, but the only reason I can make changes like that if I get get it from authority. 
So I had to approach Suge and let him know that I would rather not be on the website and be classified as his artist. And it took a lot of courage because at that point in my life, being affiliated with Suge and the role was the biggest thing I could imagine. Right, right. I had no prospect of anything bigger coming and it was like, but I was still realizing it wasn't doing me justice. So I had to swallow that, step away from Suge. And then just ironically enough, the next phase in my life with uh, my career was I was trying to go independent with some street niggas up out of Watts. And the main cat that was being the director of the team, the coach at that point, you know, his, his concept was to get it out the mud. And f therefore we were at Atlanta. And he took me to Atlanta, introduced me to a handful of people. He jumped back on a plane, went to LA, and I was in Atlanta with all the work. And yeah. I was, we was finna make it happen and get our budget and do our thing. Uh, independent. Shout out to my nigga Pipe the Snipe. Everybody eat. You already know what it do. YOLO. And then um, what happened was my brother at the same time, shout out to Big Spider, he was in Nashville, Tennessee. You know how close Nashville and Atlanta was. Right. While he was in Atlanta on his little grind, we in a brother brotherly rivalry sense used to talk to each other and give each other updates on what it was going on Nashville to Atlanta. And one of his updates started to include it. This nigga Young Buck from G-Unit, nigga. I'll be out here in Nashville, nigga. He pull up to the projects. It's 30, 40 niggas outside. He grabbed me. We jump in the tray and hit Cone and smoking. He started saying things like that to a point where I was like, well, nigga, had that nigga call my phone? Yeah. And then he was like, he took the challenge. He was like, matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to call you right back. And next thing I know, Buck called my phone. And that led up to um, my brother, Young Buck, and the people that introduced my brother to Young Buck all came to meet me in Atlanta because Young Buck was on the straight out of Casual tour and it was scheduled to come to Atlanta. So that Nashville crew that had introduced my brother to Young Buck all came to Atlanta and we hung out for a few days awaiting Young Buck to get to Atlanta on his radio tour. And just by chance, a couple of days before he got to Atlanta, the G-Unit spinner had got taken in Chicago. And the people that introduced my brother to Buck was so close to Buck that when he got to town in Atlanta, he went to radio and his squad went to his hotel room. So by the time he got to his hotel room, I was already in there with a lot of people that he knew. Mm -hmm. And he came in there talking about the chain and things progressed from there. But that's initially how I got connected with the uh, G-Unit situation. And when you got with G-Unit, you got immediately involved in that whole beef with game. Is that Almost immediately. Okay. It seems immediately now in hindsight, but for a long time I wasn't involved. You know, I would talk to 50 behind the scenes about it, and he would advise me not to get involved. Yeah. Uh, how, a game initially used to make songs dissing the members of G-Unit, but he would say positive things about me in the same song mm. to make sure he tried to keep me out of it. Right, right. However, there were more than one of these. Mm. A lot of these floating around, and we was G-Unit, West and G Unit Cripping, G Unit period, a lot. And here he was in LA, just G U not and it's just not in my spirit to sit it out. To let it look it, it was just like I felt like if you want to do a record and say, fuck them, but I roll out the blue carpet for Spider, then I think in reality you should have respected it enough to say, fuck him, him, and him, and not G Unit when you see I'm pushing it. Mm. That's like dissing the set instead of getting mad at the nigga you mad at. You're going you gonna to invoke a defensive nature in anybody that represent what you dissing. Mm. Now, what was that confrontation with you guys and Lil Wayne? It was something with you and Lil Wayne and all those guys and Baby. What was that about and what, well, when did that happen? That happened, um, I can't quote a date, but those that are familiar with the record, he had a single out at that time. Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne, right. where his, he had a line that says, Sue Wu Gang, if you ain't with that, you in the food chain. And that just didn't rub me the right way for one industry affiliation i was a lot younger that back then and a lot more interested in what uh gang shit was resonating through the industry and he said that and in my mind suwu gang if you ain't with that you in the food chain food chain food chain i think about the ocean and and I just thought about crabs. I'm like, okay, he dissing. Mm -hmm. He's a college student. He's real lyrical. That's his way of dissing. Mm -hmm. And I felt like if L.A. artists that represent the red side and the blue side don't do that type of thing, I felt like it was unacceptable. So it was something that had been on my mind just for every time I heard that record, I used to think about it. And then and this is another thing that would date the time frame. It just so happened um, 
it was a period of time where I had a a, a record that was produced by Felly Fell and T Pain was on the hook, mm -hmm. and I had yet to meet T Pain. Felly Fell for Power One Hundred Six. Yeah, shout out to Felly Fell, yeah. the legend. And um, I was looking for opportunity to um, finally meet T Pain and ask him would he support the record, let him hear it, see if he liked it. Right. And just so happened, I had a studio in North Hollywood at the time, and T Pain, by chance, I realized was there shooting a video to that song. Uh, you slide me out in Aspen, Aspen. Yeah. So that dates it again, if yeah, you yeah. want to realize when it was. So or 2008, I'm thinking. Okay, yep, yeah. yeah, right around there. So when I realized he was there shooting a the video, um, he was at my location of my studio. However, it's similar to your compound, and the way it was designed is you can be over here where the audio recording goes on, the, the recording studios. But on the same address, there's another section where they do um, visual recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know where it is. I've been in okay, that studio. Okay, no problem. All right. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah right exactly there. Where it is. Yeah. So when when I real when I realized that T, what happened was I had walked across the other side to get a, a blank DVD, and when I saw the production, I saw somebody on the crew. I said, "Y'all shooting a video today?" He's like, "Yeah, some guy named T Pain. Is he um is he big?" It was a white dude. Yeah. I'm like, "Hell yeah!" But mind you, I had that record. Yeah, it, yeah. I go, I burn a DVD, I burn a CD. I go drive around. When I go drive around, they had a, a security dude in the middle of the street that asked me, you here with uh, T-Pain? I'm like, nah. He said, you here with Lil Wayne? And that was my first mm -hmm. mind that Lil Wayne was going to be involved in what's ever going on. Mm -hmm. So mind you, I just know T-Pain shooting a video. I want to come play my song for him and politic and hope, you know, whoop. So when the security dude asked me, was I here with T-Pain? I'm like, nah. He like, you here with Lil Wayne? I'm like, nah. I got a studio down there. He got real respectful and apologetic. He like, oh, okay, and let me through. Mm. But now I'm thinking like Lil Wayne. I'm thinking I'm about to see Lil Wayne. However, when I go, I had Eno with me from the Bay, AKA, his new name is Replay. He, he sung on the hook of Beautiful World and a lot of my records back then, he's a very talented artist. He's an R&B dude, non-confrontational. So I took, he was with me. So we go down there to go meet T-Pain. And when I walk into the video shoot, his number one security is a, a friend of mine who happened to be um, 50s man security when I first met him. Yeah. His name is Anton, shout out to Anton. So when Anton seen me, he came right to me, asked me what was going on. I let him know what my interest was. Yeah. He walked straight to T-Pain, told him whatever, T-Pain came. I talked to him about the record. Cool, 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 cool. He said, it's all good. So it was somebody else there I know that I won't name. Mm -hmm. I seen Lil Wayne wasn't there. So as I went back to my studio, I told that individual, as soon as you get there, let me know. Mm -hmm. So as hours passed, I keep checking. He's like, nah, he ain't there yet. He ain't there yet. But in the meantime, I swear to God, death before the sun, and shout out to my nigga Shice, rest in peace, from 62nd Street. He was fresh out. I called my nigga Shice. I'm like, hey, whoopty wop wop, finna be wop wop whoop if you want to whoop wop wop wop. So I called Shice the few, um, when Shice came, he called a few homies. Them homies called a few homies. Them homies called a few homies. Big payback was from the 818, North Hollywood. Yeah. He called a gang of homies. Now, next thing you know, we got a parking lot full of Crips waiting for Lil Wayne to show up at this video shoot around the corner. And I'm going to be honest. Uh... I had intentions on going around there and allowing, allowing the people that was with me to cause a whole lot of damage. Mm. But um, the way the creator works in mysterious ways, I was with 40 Glock, and he, I don't know if you recall, Kite Phones, K-Y-T-E. Yeah, yeah. They were like, like one of the first live streaming devices I was familiar with. Mm. Way back then, he was interested in going live on a Kite Phone, which caused all the people with us to be apprehensive about right, being. They want to be on film. Yeah. And it saved me because right. now you see, I, it's no telling how things could have progressed. Lil Wayne wasn't actually in the vehicles. He was just dropped off in the two vehicles that we encountered. They had Baby and Slim in them. And I didn't realize that they had just dropped Lil Wayne off and they were leaving. And I thank the creator once again. I didn't realize that. Cause we would have bypassed the vehicles and went right into that video shoot that I was at earlier. Mm -hmm. It was a very small area. You see how many people it was. Yeah. So and didn't, didn't payback pass pass away? Rest later? in peace to payback. Rest he in, yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. God what, what year did he pass? You gonna fuck me up trying to um, <laughs> um do the year, but it was a few years after that. Okay. okay. So RIP to big maybe yeah, R.I.P. the big payback. Let me see. It had to be like twelve or thirteen, I believe. Okay, okay. Maybe eleven. Yeah. Oh no, you know what? Like fourteen. 
Okay. 2014. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a long. We don't realize time how long flying. ago. Yeah, time fly, don't it? Yeah. yeah. It's just, and then when it comes to industry and my personal acquaintances, and you take neighborhood nip, payback. Um, even Gonzo, Slim 400, yeah, and Snoopy yeah, Blue, yeah. the list gets long about how many of my personal friends that are associated with the industry have um, made headlines with their death to gun violence. It's yeah. like, wow. Yeah. Now, yeah. you were on G-Unit with 50 Cent. Eventually, you and 50 fell out. What made you and 50 fall out? Well, there was never an actual fallout. There was more of a fallout of communication and interest on his behalf. And what happened was I took it on the chin. No negative commentary went on about my life. Um, however, I did a Doggy Diamonds um, interview. Shout out to Doggy Diamonds in about 2017. I went to New York yeah. and, I, and he asked me questions that caused me to explain my experience. And um, no, I'll go right before that. It was even more simple than that. It was a regular um, Throwback Thursday. I ran across a clip on, on um, in my in my library in my phone where Fifty Cent was hating on me. Mm. The very first time he went live in two, two, uh, 07. he was overseas and he went, he went live from This Is Fifty, and he had Yayo and um, Banks kind of like winging him in behind. He had advertised on This Is Fifty for quite some time that on such and such date you would be able to go live with G Unit. Going yeah. live was a pretty new thing. Yeah, it was. And when he finally launched his live, you could tell as he reading the questions in the chat, he immediately got irritated because the questions were pertaining to myself and Hot Rod. Mm -hmm. And his response was to the audience, man, what he, what's all these questions about Spider Look? You don't even know how to ask good questions. Oh, and he went on with some rhetoric similar to that. So what happened was some time passed, we stopped communicating. Obvious we were no longer associated with each other. I never expressed any type of disdain or any type of negativity in the public. But one day I went um, on Thursday, on Throwback Thursday, I posted on my little page with my few followers and my comment, my um, my caption said something like, Throwback Thursday, when I figured out 50 Cent was hating on me. And he couldn't resist responding. And his response was via his Instagram, and it was a, a, a page, it was a, a quote that says something to the effect of, I wasn't hating, I was just frustrated because you didn't deliver, I signed OT Genesis, it didn't work out, the next thing you know, in love with the Coco, what's up cuz, where your shit at, or something like that, trying to like deflect as if the fact that we didn't experience success one with another was my fault, which is yeah. the furthest thing from the truth. Yeah. So when he did that, which I consider is a lie on a lie on me because he, he declared I didn't deliver. Mm. And, you know, shout out to Puto, Turtle Rest in Peace, yeah. all my witnesses, amongst others, Kai Miller and other people that were around when he let me know that my album was complete and ready to go for sale. So if that's the perspective he wanted to give to the public after all these years and it was dishonest, that's when I became comfortable being more honest about him and disrespectful because mm. If I am 100% honest about everything that I experienced, then I'm sure he will feel disrespected by some of the things that I state. And I just like, after biting my tongue and, tongue and being careful not to be offensive, just get finally, you finally get tired of not being comfortable enough to just tell it how it is when all I, if, if I show you, matter of fact, I'm gonna just show you the little clip. You tell me like, you know the history, the relationship. If yeah. we've if we never had anything negative between he and I, and I am your artist, and which is a product that you have investment in, you explain to me how this is cool. So, mind you though, Tyreek, I did not react negatively toward him once he said this. Mm. I took it on the chin. However, years later, years later, on a throwback Thursday. I posted it and said, hey, this is when I remember um, when I realized Cuz was hating on me. And when I did that, he reacted. And when he reacted, yeah, I kind of went on one. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. You know, I only felt comfortable trolling him so much is because he was comfortable trolling in general. Mm -hmm. If you notice my internet experience in these last three or four years, I've done a lot of trolling. But I've only been comfortable trolling trolls. Because mm -hmm. trolling is not in my natural character. Yeah. I'm capable but it's not something I normally do. But if you high profile and I have a personal 
connection and issue with you and you are troll, I will. I will troll you with no problem. Yep. Now, a lot of people, the consensus was that 50 was trying to make G-Unit basically somewhat of a crip set. How true was that? Well, I can not recall when we first started interacting and he did express like slight um, appreciation for the blue over the red. However, when I started hollering G-Unit Crip, I can recall him giving me like um, energy of warning or apprehension in the sense that he, I remember he told me in reference to the uh, law enforcement, he was like, yo B, they believe you with that G-Unit Crip shit. Cause you know G-Unit Crip is as fake as anything can be. Right, 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 but right. the members and affiliates were so real in what they were already associated with, it was hard to tell that we was just playing. Mm. We just rap playing, but right, right, right. It, it caught a wave. He never expressed any interest me personally, that he wanted to see his label affiliated with gangs. However, he did come to L.A. and handpick gang-affiliated artists. Mm. But he never, I think he wanted the association, but I don't think he really realized what that came with. Why do you think um, the check-in has been so important with people coming out to L.A. and the narrative that they need to check in? Why well, do you think that's been so important? Well, I think L.A. is... A, had a history for long for victimizing people who are high profile in the industry that come out here thinking it's sweet. And the most uh, effective way to, to make sure you don't become a victim is being in touch with somebody that can kind of like secure your travel and situation. Um, the fact that people are making something of intimidation and be uh, uh, bold to claim it it's kind of indicative of the times. People are doing all type of shit on camera, which is not traditionally what G's do. Mm -hmm. The fact that they want to be bold enough to holler out, yeah, check in, that's slightly different than what I um, remember it being. I can really recall from my history being out here, that's like a a spirit or a temperature that Suge Knight set. Suge Knight made it to where niggas from out of town, you better know somebody when you out here. Yeah. And I could be wrong, Anybody that know better than me can challenge me, but from what I can recall, that was the way Suge put it down, and those that carried it on, most of them was personal affiliates with Suge that extended it. Mm. Yeah. Now, a lot of times you see a lot of artists buying their way onto a set. You know what I'm saying? What do you think about that vibe now? I don't see it too much on the blue side. Do you see it on the blue side a lot? I have to be honest and say I'm guilty myself. I allow Young Buck to claim my hood mm. ba based on the fact that he provided financial um, gain for me. Mm. So as corny and whack as we all might want to um, admit it or claim it to be, I got to first admit that I participated. Mm. So um, I think I could look at it both ways, you know, Basically, this game banging comes from the environment of the have-nots, poverty. Yeah. So, you know, allowing someone to be associated for the benefit of the overall, I don't think it's a total negative, but I think it does cheapen the brand of what we say we believe in when we allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fine line. Like I say, I participated, and I'm not the bottom line of none of this shit, and I think it goes on. I think you just got to be careful and make sure you get um, something adequate when it comes to terms of compensation right. when you start allowing these affiliations to be uh, made. I know me personally as being a public figure, I would not be comfortable with somebody else on a public level like Young Buck claiming my hood if he wasn't compensating correctly. Mm -hmm. And I can at least say when I compare to what I've seen other people do, I think I'm ranking in what I got out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's up there. It's not like he got me for a jelly roll. Mm -hmm. You feel me? You know, uh, Chris Brown and Soldier Boy, they claim a, a Compton Pyro hood. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, you know, certain people are benefiting. But I'm just curious: is the the public figures from that section are they benefiting? Don't Tiger claim a Pyro hood too? Tiger, I, if, I'm, if I'm not correct, at least he used to claim Hoover. Lately, um, Tiger's been like on the internet with Chanel sandals and pastel toenail polish. Yeah, then he just recently went Kardashian. 
So I'm not sure if he even is trying to maintain any affiliation at this point. But if I'm not mistaken, when he was professing affiliation, it was with the Hoovers. You know, speaking of Tiger, they just made him apologize for a music video. Bro, I've been seeing the headlines. Man, what do you think about that? They, they oh, brought the name up. of the song was Ike Ramba. I haven't heard it, so I don't know what about it could be deemed um, disrespectful. But however, I just want to say on that subject, there's a whole culture of Hispanics that say nigga like it's an everyday word. So if we're going to start being sensitive about things, I haven't heard the song. Yeah. So I cannot take a real um, stance on it. But it was just, more so the video. The video he was, to me, it looked like he was kind of comedically paying homage to Hispanic culture, but it was kind of over the top. I don't think he was being malicious with it. You know what I'm saying? I, I can not imagine him, the character that he presents, trying to have problems with serenios or essays in general. Yeah. I don't think he was looking for that. Yeah. So if he can go through a production and go all the way to final cut and edit and still be um, offenses toward them, then maybe there was apologies in, due, in, mm -hmm. in order. I haven't seen it. Yeah. But, you know, when I first just seen the headlines and just my initial perspective is, I caramba, okay, but, like, we accept them saying nigga every day. Every, every day. day. Yeah. So I, I just can't imagine what he did so disrespectful that warranted an apology. But maybe an apology when it's not appropriate is kind of consistent with pastel toenail polish. Yeah. I'm just saying. And shout out to Tiger. I'm cool with Tiger. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm cool with everybody, man. I'm just, you know, I just, it's hard to ignore facts, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not lying about the Chanel sandals and the toenail. I'm not, it's not a lie. Yeah, yeah. Um, Whack 100, man, what's... Whack no honey. This no, is, no, this what's going on with you and Whack? What, what's well, happening? the reason you? why I've been so vocal, once again, and disrespectful toward him, although I've been honest, is because he took the opportunity to be dishonest about me yeah. and disrespectful in the same um, breath. He tells this story, this imaginary story that never took place where he supposedly responded to Game being in distress at my threat and for some unknown reason to everybody in the world. He was, game had enough time to call Wack. Wack had enough time to convince you wherever they were that they needed to respond, get to the scene, and he was still able to come in time to save game from me doing something to him, even though I was already there, had him hemmed up. Yeah. Never happened. Um, the incident took place, I wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Prodigy, rest in peace for Mob Deep, also recalled this exact incident in his book and he did not include me when he gave a roll call for everyone was that was there. 40 Glock for years has been given an account of this incident. And because he even desires the credit for what took place that day so much, he's been adamant about the fact that I wasn't there. He wants to be known for being the one that kicked up that little dust that day because obviously the game was hemmed up. Mm -hmm. But it was for a amount of time where apparently – there was no time for him to make phone calls mm. and somebody to come and mediate. There is never, ever a possibility upon the face of the planet. Had I been on my guy like that, there would be an opportunity for, f what was we waiting on? I did that. But this is when I, when I came out of hiatus and looked at this interview and saw him, I'm looking at the screen and he's telling this untruth. It blew my mind. So just so y'all know, I spoke to him over the telephone about it. He spoke to whack. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, man, I wasn't there, bro. Yes, you was, Spider. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, Prodigy, you talking about everybody wrong? Whack, why is it not one other person in the world that is remembering me be there but you? Mm -hmm. Not only is he placing me there, he had a whole fabricated conversation he had with me about G-Unit, G-Unit Crips, batteries in my bag, 50 cent, game in 50 going. It's all fake imaginary. Mm. So when I saw his confidence of being so creative when and putting my name in his mouth and being derogatory in the sense that he could never have that type of conversation with me in person. Every conversation we ever had in person, Wack has been none other than humble, timid, passive, and agreeable. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the best way I could describe him. But if you look at him on the internet and how he tried to describe himself now, he kind of started that campaign, including my name. So once I saw that, it was like, you know what? If you're going to lie on me, I'm going to be honest on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that never happened. I was never there. Um, how's Nina Boy doing, man? Um, I, Nina Boy going to be all right, man. Yeah, Nina Boy has a uh, YouTube channel. He just did a fight, a, a boxing thing with um, Bosco. 
Yep, six nine seven for Def Dope. Um, I know you might be aware that Nina Boy and I, our energy is not extremely um, loving at the moment oh, as far what as. Happened? What happened now with that? Well, you know, um, there's a lot of people um, that's affiliated with our section that was kind of disappointed in his performance. And one of those individuals who was quite vocal about it, uh, I kind of like shared his perspective on my channel. And Nina Boy didn't appreciate that. Mm. Um, I'm not finna go into why I was comfortable doing that. You know, I'm gonna just keep it off the... So y'all, y'all feel like he kind of make the block look bad? I'm gonna say, speaking on behalf of a gang of homies, yes. However, I want to make it clear that I never went on record saying that. You know, because we, he and I were on this public platform together, I kind of like bit my tongue and tucked my tail on giving my perspective and my opinion on his performance just to save face for the set and the homie. Yeah. However, one of our other homies who voice, you know, literally is bigger than mine, but as far as his presence on the internet is not big as mine, he was vocalizing the way he felt, and then I kind of like amplified what he said by putting it on my platform, and Nina Boy didn't appreciate that. So... How are you now? What What's the vibe now? Well, um, he and I, um, out of respect for what we represent, have both agreed, from what I can understand, to leave it alone on the internet. However, you know, I reached out to a mutual party to try to uh, get on a three-way, and he denied that opportunity. But, uh, you know, it's all love with me. It's like uh, I never really had no ill feelings toward him. I, he did make some decisions that confused me. But they was, you know, nothing I couldn't really handle. I was never going to take an opportunity to go at Nina Boy publicly. Right, right, right. You know, I did allow another homie to express what he had already expressed publicly on my platform as well. And he seemingly had took, um, took offense to the fact that I allowed that person to say it on a larger platform than it was already on. Now, what do you think about the current state of the rap game on the West Coast now, particularly Southern California? Um, I feel like the rap game in general, as far as the whole thing, the identity thing has almost disappeared. Yeah, yeah. You know, so shout out to Kendrick just for the yeah. fact that he has a unique um, presence and individuality in the style. However, it seems like the generation after Kendrick, everyone sounds like everyone. You couldn't even tell where somebody's from by hearing their record. Yeah, um, I'm not saying that in a negative light. It's just an observation, and it's different from what it has always been. And I try my hardest not to be the dinosaur dissing what is because it's not what was, which I'm affiliated with. It's just different. I'm not really tapped into every, the heartbeat of the current um Hip hop scene. Uh, through my children, I'm vaguely aware of what's cracking, but uh, I know it's some new shit, bro. Like, I know that the um, the desire to hear real quality lyrics is really not present. You, you know, the, when you're creating, when you go to think about creating successful work, being lyrical is not really part of the equation. It seems right. I think uh, the, a lot of the spirit kind of went out the window when Nipsey passed. Um, how cool are you with Nips? Extremely cool. Um, I, I I believe I have the honor of putting Nipsey in his very first music video. Mm -hmm. We have a record called Come Smoke One With Us. Y'all go check it out. Spotted Low featuring Nipsey Hussle. And it was at the very onset of his career. And then, however, while he was on the... Um, on the on when he was on the climb, I went on a seven year hiatus, mm -hmm. which caused me at, at when he really got to the bubbling stage and at his height, when I got back in the game, I wasn't in his mix mm -hmm. as if you know perhaps I would have uh, desired to be, but as I jumped back in the game, we got the politicking, and it seemed like as soon as he grabbed me in and we was on like a every other day communication, he was sending me records he was taken from us all. Yeah. And he was like my last real friend in the industry when it comes to rappers, executives, someone with influence that was willing to lend their likeness to my campaign. Yeah. He was the last and it was like, as much as the world and his family and everyone mourned and suffered and took a loss, I feel goofy or selfish to even try to express how personal I took it. Right. Because there's right. so many right. people closer to him and then the world felt it as such a uh, magnificent, 
level in general, but. Now, did you know of Shitty Cuz beforehand? Not at all. Not at all. Right. Not at all. What do you think was the real deal behind that? Because I got all types of conspiracy theories about it. I don't think it was, to I, me, I don't think it was just some random, you know, bullshit. I believe that, you know, Eric Carter may have had um, mixed emotions about the homie prior to that, but I tend to think that that day the conversation was triggered by something similar as to what has been leading. I don't think that they were the best of friends, and then that day that conversation came up and he was motivated to react like that. Yeah. However, I think there was some jealousy, negative feelings amongst them, and I think um, whatever was said triggered him, that side of him that already existed. And, you know, I love the homie, cause so I'm not finna go in depth as to what may or may not have taken place, however, I can recall when it initially happened, you know, on the streets, it was reports that the homie went slightly bigger on him than is being said now. Mm. So yeah. outside of him just respectfully mentioning um, that he might have an issue he need to tend to, I can recall hearing that the homie went slightly bigger. And I'm not sure if that played a part or not, but he may have felt embarrassed and, you know, that might play a part. Some niggas is simple. That some people say that the female he was with said if she was fine. Mm. But some niggas, that's all it takes. Yeah. Especially if you are ready with the shits. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. What What was the situation that happened with you and Yuck Mouth? What was that situation? How did that unfold? Well, um, shout out to Yuck. That's my nigga. Smoke a lot. Yeah. On oh, my mama, mama. But uh, at that time, um, he had been on record being very vocal this and G on it. And the evening that that incident actually took place, we were in the club and for one reason or another, I wasn't feeling his energy. So I was trying to, to be honest, look for a reason to like get at him. Yeah. And when we finally, when I was in his face, the thing that could come to my mind was, cuz why you always dissing G on it? And his response was, ah oh, man, you know, I just, I ride with Jay Prince like you ride with old boy, and that caused me to fire on him. Mm -hmm. It was, I brought a real game bang mentality to the industry. Mm -hmm. An ignorant, east side, foolish mentality. Mm -hmm. Thinking that I was doing what was on point because I was with the type of niggas that celebrated that, and that's what was looking for. It was very, un, uh, it was naive of me. And you know, yeah, I was pushing that type of line on a lot of petty issues back then. Now, what would you tell, because you're older, you're wiser, you've lived that, you've been there, you've done that, you learned from the mistakes. What would you tell a, a, an 18 year old dude getting out here gang banging who just got put on, who want to get in the industry and, and use some strong arm tactics and do all of that stuff and you know get out here and make niggas check in and do all that. What would you tell a young dude who's just getting into that life right now as an OG? That type of energy is just as effective as it is if you were working for FedEx Amazon or any other corporation. We do don't be foolish enough to look at the industry as anything other than a corporation where people who are invested and interested in being um, profitable gather and network in order to turn a profit. The fact that the imagery may look grimy and gangster, don't let that fog your focus. Once you have made up your mind that you want to be successful and part of your success is being popular and you want the public to accept you, you have to realize that's where you leave active gang politics and activity. The more you try to blend them, the more difficult it is going to be to achieve your goal and the quicker it is going to be for you to crash out. You know, I tell a lot of people, man, a lot of the OGs, they really try to discourage a lot of young cats to get into the game. Have yeah. you discouraged young dudes to? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, and, and, and even the people like how you guys might view me as Spider from East Coast, a rapper, turned down, been turned down for years, inactive, I'll take that. However, all the people my age and older than me that I respect and looked up and look up to from East Coast that are considered reputables, that have no um, industry experience, no public uh, presence, they tell me, you better stay away. You better not get caught up in this bullshit. You'll be stupid if you do. 
this the same message I tell to youngsters. I met, I went to jail recently, and I was in Burbank, and I met a youngster who happened to tell me that he was from the hood. I'm not gonna say what specific clique. Yeah. Um, it's obvious to me that he's not from around there like that. Mm. Um, I'll just give this hint. He's from one of the cliques that's block, block crip, right? Mm. And I asked him if he had any tattoos. He's like, yeah, I got the, the NY tattoo. And I had to educate him that the clique you claiming is not neighborhood, they blocks. Mm. And I felt it, um, you know, upon myself to tell him, bro, change your life. Mm-hmm. It ain't worth it. Yeah. His lingo, you could tell he's a, I, I, I gave him a small little survey to see where he was at with it. And he's just the most recent example, but yes. Yeah, these I, little niggas become walking targets when you talk to them. You know they're going to get hit just by their swag. and just, you Or know. get sent. Yeah. Or get sent to yeah. be, throw your life away. And that's what they got out there for you. And um, like, even one of, like even in my section, when I think about the people that have come beyond, after me with the same spirit that I carried, they've been sacrificed. One of the most notables. I got people tap. I told an old story on an interview recently, and it was a historic story. And because I told the account of this story and mentioned a certain individual that I respected what happened back then, I got cats tapping me on my shoulder just for even mentioning that guy because that guy is no longer any good. And the reason why they consider him no longer any good because there's a very young soldier who life has been lost and they feel like he's responsible by being... um, on the young homie. Yeah. I advise every young man. I have children that are grown, so I can't give any youngster any advice I wouldn't give my children. Right, right. I do have a whole nother level of advice for individuals that are involved, though. When you in it, and I know you in it, and this is not a conversation, when it's time for me to try to get you out of it, I got that's a different conversation. There are people that are young enough to where I wish they weren't involved, but they are fully involved. I talk to them totally different than I talk to the people who are in the valley of decision and on the, on the uh, right. yeah. Now, what do you think about this whole thing where we have recently seen dudes in LA, which is some shit we've never really seen back in the past, but dudes who get on Instagram and do all this Instagram banging, and then they go to somebody's block and you know spray paint the block and go spray paint a Nipsey mural that type of goofy clout chasing bullshit. Where did that come from? I really think it's just the it's a, the clout. That's the word you use to describe it and without being like too specific. Right, right. It seems like that's what it is, man. I don't know what caused but you know what I to to everyone's defense, I want to say this cuz I got to admit it one of my most favorite um footages from the years is a, a DVD or interview uh, OG Turtle and the Santanas yeah. from 1984. Yeah. And he was. R.I.P. Sh- the Turtle. Rest in peace to yeah. the great legend. Yeah. But he was showing guns. Yeah. Talking about shooting at the Lutus Parks. Mm-hmm. So as I try to like look at it like it's such a far fetched thing, now I see it's just the graduation of what was. Our forefathers, even though they was really with the shits, they enjoyed. Showing, Showing it off. It off. Yeah. 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 And I yeah. believe that's just part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Spider Man, where can people find you? Where can they find your podcast? Where can they find you on social media, bro? I'm glad you said podcast because shout out to Alex Alonzo, yes. um, who's just um inspired me to start a brand new podcast. He's producing it for me. It's called Facts Over Feelings. You can find that at all your um podcast streaming locations. That's Facts F A C T Z. O V A feelings F E E L I N Z facts over feelings. We're very more um, accessible. You can catch me on YouTube at youtube.com backslash spotalok most easty. That's where the black box goes up. And most recently, I want to announce that you can catch the black box episodes on the Tubi app um, on all your streaming devices. We just became available on Tubi, so. Outside of that, Spot of Locomotive Easty 7 on Instagram. And then everywhere it's popping at after that, we're going to be there. No doubt. And um, y'all know I'm doing that documentary about West Coast music. My good brother is going to be in it representing. I, I want to yes, show sir. That, that, that street dudes can sit down and talk intelligently. There's this misconception that dudes who come from the mud, who street, 
are, are some mush mouth babbling niggas. Far you know, this from is a very it. smart dude, man. And a lot of guys, especially from his set, I'm cool with a lot of those dudes. They're real intelligent brothers, man. They give you some good game if you sit down and just chop it up with them. So, um, man, I appreciate you, brother. Likewise, man. Back, man. I appreciate your humility because I didn't even get a chance to um, announce to the people how honored I am to be here with such a strong, uh, established, successful mind on the behalf of our melanated uh, culture. So I appreciate being here. I appreciate you accepting me. Yes, on oh, my mama, mama. Oh, man. Thank man. you, man. Anytime, my yes, brother.